So when you're drawing your, your subjects, if you're getting it from a magazine or online or Instagram or any of those places, it's probably lit poorly and as a result is giving you bad habits. Um, if your subjects are lit sculpturally, as this is, which is basically a single light source where the main architecture of the face is clear and readable, it makes rendering easy. If you have bad lighting like my face now, rendering is hard, right? Because you have to, it's just really complicated. But this fellow, right, the side plane of his nose has a shadow, the side plane has a shadow, he's basically a big egg, right? So if you have good lighting, that makes the game a lot easier for you. So think about that. You don't want to build bad habits. So that's why I chose this, this here. Um, another thing that's really helpful is to create variations and inspiration for whatever your subject is going to be. So I'll start actually here. Does anyone have any idea what these little things in the corners might be? Yeah, the heavy contrast of either the light shapes or the dark shapes. Um, how many values are the key amount of values you want in the painting? How many? One, three. Three, that's the magic number. Um, so having a light, a dark, and then a mid-tone is it. And you may think, that sounds too simple. The most beautiful things in life are. The most sophisticated paintings that you've ever seen are held together by three values with subtle variations between. So what this information immediately tells me is this is where the highlights are on this face, and this is where the deepest, darkest recesses, that sounds really dark, the, the deepest, darkest moments of this face are. So that's already providing me that information. Then I have the full value version. Now, I was doing this in school sort of on my own because it made sense. What was really exciting is that this museum has an online archive of a lot of Rockwell's reference photography. And in the dark room, he would, uh, he would have his developer develop pictures just like this. So that was kind of affirming that, that process. Because again, information is power. The more information you have, the more you can stylize and go off of that. The less information, the more you kind of have to stick to it, right? So you're going to hear that over and over. Inform yourself of what you're dealing with. This is, or this shows two separate paintings by two different artists. This is Nigel Buchanan, amazing illustrator, fantastic. Definitely check him out. And this is Rockwell, the piece The Flirt, where there's the two gentlemen in the blue car, and then there's the woman in the, the convertible. Um, in any event, they both represent similar lighting situations, as well as I did the same contrast experiments between the two. So as far as what I'm working on, I have the original reference and contrast variations. Then I have how other artists have handled similar situations and their variations within that. So before I'm even starting, I have everything I need to set myself up for a successful piece. You're not always going to have this opportunity, but when you do, it's going to be hugely to your advantage. So start, start off with that content. Um, so this is illustration board. Um, who here has worked with illustration board? Some folks. I, I wasn't until a junior in school that I even know that that existed. I would just work on whatever paper. But how your mediums interact with your surface is actually pretty important. So some of the main things to think about are cold or hot press. Cold press board is going to have more tooth, and it's going to allow the dryness of the media to drag a bit. Um, so if, for instance, if I... Uh, put some ink or paint on this brush and went like that, you would see the drag. If I had um, hot press, which is more like this table, and smooth, you wouldn't see that drag. It'd be a nice clean mark. Also, this is going to absorb a medium. Uh, hot press is going to have the medium sit on top. So if you know artists like Bernie Fuchs or what have you, imagine putting acrylic paint on, paint on this. It's not going to suck in right away. It's going to almost bubble up. So a lot of illustrators in the 70s would mix um, soap within their paint and would paint with that. And then on hot press, you can imagine how that would bubble up. Their deadlines were so fast that that created an inherent texture and didn't have cause them to render too much. Anyways, um, the surface is important. So today, I'm working on cold press. Um, just because I wanted to absorb in, um, and that's all they had at the art store. <laughs> so I, you're gonna also uh, that's something I want to emphasize that if you can draw well, the mediums don't matter. 
Um, generally in the commercial arts, it's suggested that you have one single marketable style, and I always refuted that, and my instructors always said that's dumb, that's not commercially viable, and I'm very stubborn, so I says I'm going to make it viable, because Mark English did it, he's one of the most awarded illustrators of all time, and I, told, I went to Mark English, I said, Mark, can my style be just to be good? And he said, no, um, it can't be, even though I'm like, isn't that what you did? He's like, yeah, but I'm some random kid that's... So, um, that's why no matter if there were macaroni and, uh, you know, a piece of dirt that you found outside, if you understand how to draw and the rules of picture making, you can make that work to your advantage. It's inconsequential. You then just pick your medium that relates to the mood and the vibe of the piece and the client, right? And that also keeps me, again, waking up in the morning that when I want to attack a piece, um, I don't necessarily have a step one through five that I'm going to take because, you know, I got seven mediums here. This can all have a different influence on the style, and I promise I'm going to paint. I'd like to talk too, though. Um, so that's why I moved from digital, and digital is fine, and I'm sure there's a lot of respect and interest in digital content out there, but that is a medium. It's one medium. There's 10,000 other mediums out there, and the digital medium is very efficient and has a place but don't let that be your only deal, right? I'm also finding in art education, there's, uh, in my day, in my day, um, in 2004, digital was new and exotic, everyone did digital. Now the newer students, um, traditional is exotic because everyone's on the computer 24 hours a day. So they want to get into the traditional medium, which is exciting and why perhaps Rockwell's being so much interest in them because people like that style. You see representational, realistic, figurative work coming out in the culture. It's because of that. So um, if you like the idea of getting really dirty, that's what we're going to do today. So again, um, let's talk about the mediums. So I have with me um, this toolbox, which is basically something you can get from Home Depot. Never buy your art box. That was about $25. This was about five. It's, they know what's happening. You're in the art store. I need to buy an art box. They're going to get you. Um, so this has a variety of charcoal. Uh, this is 2B, 4B, 6B, and a whole bunch of variations between it. Um, working with a pencil is not going to give you much surface, but it's going to give you a lot of control. Working with a stick is going to cover more surface, but take away control. Usually, humans are inclined to detail. We naturally want to have detail, so taking control away from ourselves is a lot of times to our advantage. But, as 18-year-olds, most of us use graphite pencil because you can control it, and that's totally fine, me too. But sometimes try to take the control away. It's going to first feel like, but then something cool is going to happen, right? So we got the charcoal and the variations of it. Um, then I wanted pastel, but they didn't have the new pastel that I wanted. So this is um, Karen Dosh. And these are in basically three values. Now you're probably saying, Francis, that's four. Well, you have white, black, and then two versions of my third value, midtone, just depending on what I'm trying to accomplish. But I'm going to view this as three values. Um, who knows what these are? other than like Wolverine claws. Blending stumps. Blending stumps. Who knows the super fancy French term? I forget it. That's something I'm literally asking. <laughs> it's something. It's like a... I forget. But it's really fancy. If you want to impress your friends, find out what it's called. These are really good because when you put a dense mark on a surface, and I'm going to show it in the demo, you can grab that mark and then flip it and render form very quick. I don't know how to render. I'm very poor at rendering, but I know how to make good shapes, and you use this to turn the form, and it, I'm faking like a good render. That's what I think. Um, this, is, this is what all the cool kids are using these days. This is the hot tool. Um, this is used for printmaking. You roll on your, your etching, or not your etching, your ink onto the surface, then you throw it through a, a press. That's how it's traditionally used. It's 2017. We do what we want, right? So um, you can put paint on this, and this is going to have a lot of drag when you hit the surface. So this is another way to apply a texture. Because an interesting piece of art, aesthetically, is an interesting collection of different marks. Remember that. Interesting art is a different collection of interesting marks. Use your, as many different ways to apply the marks to make your marks interesting. It will be much more exciting than if you just use one tool. Um, and then finally, I have the ink, 
to make sure it's waterproof. If you want to use any ink, this is Black Star ink. It's some of the best. It's very, very dark. I mean, it should be. It's called Black Star. Um, and then finally, I have acrylic paint. You know about that. Um, but then this is acrylic ink. So if you've ever inked before, this acts like acrylic, but um, it's ink. Um, but it goes on really, really smooth. So again, if you have any questions on some of this, let me know, but that's what I'm going to be exploring today. So let's get into it, folks. Okay, so what I'm going to do up front, is this is fun, right? It's like a mad scientist just playing with stuff. Um, so I did fill this up. This is from my hotel, Wyndham Rewards. Um, also, that hair dries from my hotel, too. Um, <laughs> make do with what you got. So I'm going to put a little ink inside here and it's going to dilute it from black which is going to allow me to start from a uh, mid-ground surface because starting from white sometimes can be a problem because white's very heavy value. You want to start usually from a mid tone. Uh, I know that I need a really thin medium so that's why I'm going to use ink. Ink isn't very heavy necessarily. So this is going to be the one I work on. This is sort of going to be my test piece over here. So all I'm doing is toning this surface. And what's really exciting about this um, is that the idea of diluting your ink can be almost made mathematical and make rendering really easy. I'm sorry for the Rockwell table. Um, because imagine you have three cups, and remember I said three values? You have a cup with straight black ink, then you got a cup with really light ink, and then another cup with lighter, lighter ink. So you got your three values there in cups, ready to roll, no mixing involved, then you just go step through your values. It's really effective. Okay, so that's that. Nothing, nothing too crazy, right? But it's a nice surface. And the reason, again, I use ink, this is heavily watered down. This is very light. I haven't put a ton of history on here. That's going to prevent other mediums from sitting on top of it. Um, so I'm going to let that sit for a bit and do this. So I'm going to draw this gentleman on this piece of paper. And the idea is that... I'm going to matte medium this on top. Now, when I went to a program when I was a student, um, this was called the Elixir of the Gods, which was, um, that was uh, quoted by Baron Story, fantastic illustrator. This lets you sort of combine anything with anything. It's like artist glue, but fancy. Um, so the idea is I'm going to start the drawing here and adhere that to the surface, and it's going to work perfectly. There's something else that, um, is the most toxic medium, and I didn't bring it because y'all would hate me, but um, it lets you combine any medium on top of each other. Because basically you know how you're supposed to put oil on top of acrylic. You can't put acrylic on oil. Well, there's a funky medium out there that has skull and crossbones and will probably kill your second children, but it will allow you, it will allow you to do that. So there's mediums that do, do allow you to combine various mediums together. It's really exciting and will help you create exciting solutions. So I'm gonna get to that in a second, but up front, Let's draw this face. So let me say this, and, and stop me if I ever get too technical, but there's varying ways to interpret this in a drawing. There's two hemispheres. Um, one is you really strongly construct it, as if you're working construction, right? You start with the basement, and then you start building the nose and everything on top, almost in a scientific way, and there's a lot of validity to that. When you're a mature enough draftsman, you can say, I don't care about that, and just be purely expressive and start on the ear and see what happens. Um, that's pretty important, actually. That theory will guide you throughout your career. Where do you exist in that spectrum? You can pull from those various ideas um, whenever you want. So I'm just going to draw it without any construction. And this is the way art is instructed, because it's tangible, and you can have concrete um, instruction and feedback from it, right? And I'm just starting it, but, right, that's more the construction method. We're starting really simple, and I'm going to continue to refine and, and build up the, the details. 
On the other hand, how I'm actually going to do it is a little more risky. Um, while you're doing it, your confidence has to be substantial. If you make a mistake, that turns into interesting style. Um, but you have to really embrace that because a lot of us have the internal dialogue, we make a mistake, it's ruined. You gotta switch that, you make a mistake that's interesting. Um, so let's see what happens. I might ruin this, folks, but... Might be interesting. It might, it might be, right? And again, this is, that happens digitally, but again, it, it, it kinda works a little more um, when you do it traditionally. So um, my goal here is not to draw this super real. I wanna draw this in my interpretation. And the deeper you get into your art practice, um, the more you're going to want to put your stamp on something. All of us have the voice that we're searching for, right? So this photo exists. There's no reason for me to reproduce it exactly. That's why I get a little bummed when it's like, so that just looks like a photo. I'm like, well, that's a bummer. That's not what I was going for. I'm trying to make it my interpretation. That's the Francis version, you know? So. Also, if you draw like this, problematic, right? Look how much variation you can get in your stroke. When you draw sideways, you're starting to use a lot more of your wrist, your arm. Actually, if you're in the figure drawing, uh, in a figure drawing classroom, you see the horses, right? You sit like that and you get to draw. That's fine, but you can't move too much. If you're standing up, you get a solid base. You want to look cool, put your hand behind your back. <laughs> but you know, seriously, my mentor, Paul Pope, would draw with his knees. You see how much, you see that? Yeah. But you see how much variation I get? That's lively versus. So if you want to get a little of that spontaneity, do it. And also, people sit too much, it's causing health problems, and you don't want to do it. So if you haven't drawn holding it like this, try it. Also, when you pull your stroke, it's like a dance. This is more side of it, then you hit a contour. It's like dancing dolphins throughout the ocean. It's just like dancing all over the place. And if there's any young, young folks here that want to really learn art, sort of trial by fire, do caricatures, seriously. People are going to sit in front of you, you have a marker where you can't make mistakes, and they will pay you based on the quality of your art. If they don't like it, they don't have to pay you. I really love the chin and how it interacts, that's why I saved this one. I want to see if I can explore that a little bit. What can I do to make this more interesting and how it relates to the head? That gets into a lot of the theories of straight versus curves and shape relationships and stuff. So I like the idea of this being a big arc like that. And Cause nothing in nature is even. That's a really big concept. If you try to find a flower where everything's exactly the same, you're not gonna find that flower. So compositionally, right? You have a composition, don't split it in half. Split that composition in thirds, thirds uneven, all that sort of thing. So even like that always plays a role when looking into this hat lump, lump one, two, and three, if I would have made all those lumps even, that'd have been super boring. So you have first primary lump, secondary, tertiary. When I was a student, they called that mama bear, papa bear, baby bear, as far as the scale relationships. Every single mark is at a large secondary or tertiary mark, and that can break down into the eyelashes. So it depends on how big you want to explore that concept. I love that mouth, so I'm going to steal part of it. So this is what I'm dealing with now. So that's the, that's the face, right? Starting to get something happening there. I love that, right? Starting to smudge, that's cool. 
Um, there's a desire to make things perfect, but then when I do that, that's the mark of a human. And that's what art's about, right? To show that we created something. Um, so again, I always try to embrace that sort of stuff. So I need a volunteer. Do you want to be a volunteer? Can you rip this in half? Nailed it. All right. So can someone rip this one in half? Who wants to rip it in half? You want to rip it in half? And this isn't just for goofs. Any way you want. Okay, so again, we're, we're creatures of a desire for detail. We want to get detail, so we always have to counter that and fight it. So if we can build steps into our process where we take away control and we get chance, that's exciting. And I think that's one of my favorite parts of art making. So there's an artist. I always forget his name. Let me see if I can find it. I can't remember. But what he does um, is he'll do a very accurate portrait of somebody. It's, he does stuff for like Newsweek, really big clients, right? Um, and there's a lot of ways to handle a portrait. Usually it's pretty straightforward, start with a sketch and go on from there. But what if you do an exact likeness and then rip it apart and assemble it again? All the features are still going to be accurate, but the stylization you get from reassembling these disparate pieces of paper is going to challenge the viewer. I think it's that person instead of that's absolutely that person. That's pretty exciting. So again, exploring that idea here. We're going to also get different shapes in the face. Okay, so this is the fun part with the matte medium. Now, technically, I would spray this with spray fix, uh, which would seal that charcoal a little bit, but again, y'all wouldn't like me because it's very stinky. So I'm just going to brush it on top. It's going to smudge the charcoal, but it's no big deal. We try to try to go with it. So hold the rest of his head go. Oh, wait. So I'm doing this purely for aesthetic persons, purely for style, for a demo. You know, it's, it makes an interesting demo. But generally, you want a concept. So what if the concept was, uh, you know, a, a disability, or this person had a car crash, or whatever? As illustrators, we have to solve problems. This would actually fit that concept because it's showing the the breaking up of the subject, literally by tearing the piece of paper together. So that could be a legit reason to do it. But again, now I'm not doing it because of that. But So when you're using a lot of acrylic content, whether it's acrylic paints or acrylic ink or this matte medium to a point, it's basically melted plastic, sort of. So when you put plastic on stuff, it's plastic, so there's a bit of a sealing. Like it seals the medium. Um, so the charcoal is going to smudge initially, but then it will be sealed on that forever. It's pretty funny, but we're going to go with it, folks. All right, so I could dig that. It's kind of smudging, but again, that's exciting. So since it's plastic, it is going to start to build up a surface. So you've seen how this was really smooth with the ink. This is starting to get some brush strokes. So I can be cognizant and aware of the way those brush strokes are working with form or against it. So I'm not going to get too into it. but So that's that. So this is where it exists now. So. Some things are warped a little bit, but it's creating some interesting shapes and moments. And I'm also, again, the idea of history in an image. Um, I've already put in two steps, and I haven't gotten too far yet. So um, there's going to be this, this crease on the paper. Um, then there's going to be sort of this crease. I'm going to have to react to those. If you build that again into your process, you can come up with some fun stuff. So I'm going to blow dry this. The blow drying technique is integral. <laughs> Nailed. 
Do I want to make the head light and the background dark? Or vice versa, do I want to make the head dark and the background light? That's really key, and that will guide you throughout like all your decisions that you're going to make. So I'm going to make his silhouette, this whole shape, I'm going to make that dark and the background light. So with that information, I can start filling in some of these areas a bit. So one thing to think too is that when I was young, I would start in a little tiny moment and start rendering that out and like be a fax machine, just and a piece would appear. I found that I, as I've gotten older, um, it's really important to work the whole piece at once. That's how you get really um, successful pictures. I need to get paper towels. Or This is perfect. So now it's toned throughout the piece. Now at this stage, thank you, while it's drying, you can start to pull out some moments. So the idea is to start very loose and continue to refine. If you start really tight, then you're going to get tighter and it's going to feel very stiff. So that's why when you start your first drawing, try, try to avoid uh, being so exact, right? Trust yourself, you're going to fix the problem. If you've done it once, you can do it again. So many of us, if we have a, a, uh, a successful part of the piece, like we nail an eye, but everything else is out of proportion, how many times have we changed the whole piece to fit that little good moment? Try not to do that, right? You start from big, energetic, to smaller, and more tight. So a really, really cool moment I had when I was talking about sort of the mentor and the Yoda was my, my mentor, George Pratt, who I was lucky to share a studio space with, um, was with me and I was starting to gesso a piece. You know, when you started painting, you have to gesso your canvas and everything. So it was a really guttural piece, sort of aggressive, like this painting here. And um, uh, I was making a real nice, smooth gesso layer, just being really careful about it. And he's like, that doesn't make sense. You know, go sweep up your studio, take all the dirt that you sweep up and put it in your painting. I'm like, that's awesome. And then I did. So when my brush would skip over a rock that was on my studio floor in the, the developed surface of the piece, um, that made sense because the, arc, the, the structure of my surface fit the mood I was going for. If you're trying to do a real refined, smooth piece, have a nice surface of trying to put a little more history and character and the person sort of has that, that character too, make your surface that, you know. Okay, so now we're going to start making some decisions. This is the really fun part. I'll, this is technically called preparing your surface, getting it to work just right. So, there's two best brushes as far as using ink. One's called the Raphael Kalinsky, and this isn't the technical part, but it's an orange tip. These are expensive, but they last years and years, and they take the media beautifully. The other one is the Windsor Newton Series 7, um, and those also take it beautifully. I'm going to say that this gentleman uh, is going to have a black shirt. So let's start really simple. Ooh, I can show you guys that, that roller. That'll be exciting. Whoops. Let's check this out. Okay, so you see this surface down here? Take this guy here. Let's 
But you see how interesting those marks are, like that? It's very, very cool. demo with this experimentation and everything. Admittedly, I'm sometimes a little more reserved for a gig because I have a sophisticated composition with, with characters and, and, and all sorts of stuff, but you know, just for the purpose of this, this demo, I'm being particularly loose and experimental with the mediums. I'm not always like that, but when you got a simple subject just like a, a face like this, you can really afford to kind of let loose a bit. still say this is just building up the surface, trying to make it interesting. Um, so what I've gotten to this point, I've established that he's going to be a darker silhouette compared to this white background. Most of my marks are interesting, so it still can you know, have something fun to play off of. And I've established the drawing, even though I've covered it a bit, I don't think any of us would have a hard time seeing where the eyes and the nose and everything are within here. Um, so it's at this stage that I'll spend a while just trying to make the piece something I'd want to work on top of, um, which I think has happened now. And then I'm going to go into the more refined rendering stage, which is about to happen next. So you can imagine that as I re refine it, it can end and be as tight as that, that piece there. Um, but you can start it off like this and then pull it to that point. But this, if you want it to be loose and interesting, though, I do suggest playing it here, right? Because if you trust your drawing, again, no matter how wild you go with this experimentation, your drawing will be bring it back. When I thought of realism when I was a student, I thought every shadow system on a face, all the lights and the darks, I'd have to completely make it up for every person. When I looked at Hellboy, and Mike Mignola is the artist's name, he would simplify the face to symbols. So for, I'll show you what I mean. So. For a face as a symbol that has lighting, there's your nose, there's your brow, there's the side plane of the face, there's the forehead, here's the chin, and there's a cast shadow underneath of that, there's the other eye socket, and then there's, there's the lip. So that looks like a sculptured face, right? That's a symbol. That simplicity in the symbolic planes of a face can be memorized. That can be memorized. So when you memorize the structure of a three-quarter light, top light, side light, then when you see it like this, it becomes very approachable and you can look at the main elements you're trying to render and not care if there's all this detail, right? And as long as you get that clear, simple read, this can read at the other side of the museum, the amount of detail you put that in that is up to you and then that decision results in your style. So all this stuff. But again, just think about that simple read. And again, I, lear I learned to paint, if you consider that realistic, by looking at the simple Rockwell drawings. That was a big game changer for me. OK, so the way I'm going to handle the face is, let me see, probably with yeah, with this guy. So this is Karen Dosh. So the way that there's this black symbol here for the shadows, I'm going to fill in the, the shadows of the face. Now, when you do think about rendering, and you, let's look at, like, look at me. You see the shadows in my face? Most of them are soft. Probably from my chin, there's a cast shadow. And as it shifts from dark to light, there's pro it's probably pretty soft, right? Most art mediums are inherently sharp. You see these edges? That's sharp from there to there. Naturally, we use hard edges 
when we're starting off as artists, we use hard edges to try to make things look realistic, and that doesn't work. So here's a sphere. That shows the separation of light and darks versus here's another sphere. Let's put that dark in there. But then let's smudge that. It's starting to look more realistic, right? Mm -hmm. So when we drop in our shadows, be very considerate if the edge between the light and the dark, if that is sharp or if it's soft. If you get the shape right and the edge right, you're almost done. A lot of us go and look at all this information inside the eyes and the wrinkles and all sorts of other stuff. That's wrong priorities. You want to consider the shape edges. I teach my students, they were in here, they're like, oh, Francis and his good shapes and beautiful edges. Like That's what I tell them all the time. But it's, it's true because right, if you want to render this and put all the information in the commercial illustration deadline of usually, especially Newsweek has like an overnight deadline because the news cycles happen so fast, you see those beautiful renderings, you don't got time to necessarily go into that crazy detail, you got to be efficient. So efficiency, but some, coming from the guy that spent three years on a book, but you kind of, I mean, you get what I'm talking about. So right here on the cheek, this is a moment. So you can see, where am I at? Uh, right here, so you see this shape right there. So the point right on the crease of the cheek, that's kind of a sharp shape. But when you're moving into the exterior form of the cheek and the outside of the head, that is turning into shadow because of form. It's a form shadow. Form shadows are soft. So when I draw that here, I'm gonna make this edge sharp, but I'm gonna tickle it. I love saying that. <laughs> you, so you're gonna tickle that edge and keep it soft. And just by capturing that, it's gonna start to feel volumetric. Um, and there's a variety of ways to creating that soft versus that uh, sharp edge. And all of them, will create a different effect. So you see how I did that? I drew it in. This one, you're slowly building it up. And then watch, then sharp again. So I'm gonna take that blending stump and I'm gonna smush that edge in. So that is gonna cause that shape to feel pretty good. You wanna know the fun thing? I've never done this order of media before, so this could definitely not work. Because <laughs> usually what I'll do is use compressed charcoal, and I've built up a technique and I've got some fun results, but if I use black on the face, that's not going to give me what I want. I want a lighter value, so I'm, gonna, I'm playing with Caran d'Ache, and then I usually use new pastel, but this art store didn't have new pastel. So this is kind of all in theory, so if this falls apart, guys. Go down in a flame of glory. <laughs> but this is all easy, right? This is all in shadow, so. that I used, this color is a really magical color, it's fantastic. It's used by Sterling Hundley a lot, he turned me on to it. Oh, that's the black one. Of course. It's called Unbleached Titanium. Super funky name, but it's, it's fantastic. Um, I'd heavily recommend it. It's sort of neutral enough, but then rich enough to give you some really fun results. Kind of see a face starting to pull out out of there. 
something's happening. And again, this is just a simple shape. Get your shape just right. I'm going to tweak that edge, and then at the end, I can put in detail. Try not to get in detail right away. That's, that's a no-no. Half of my job at school is just to uh, pop behind a student and say no detail. Like that's, it's actually pretty easy. That's all I got to do. Um, so they almost know. They can hear it because I always wear these old Timberlands. They hear it. And you're like, oh, no. But it's, <laughs> but it's important. It's important. I wish I was more pressured when I was um, a student because detail is your, is your enemy. It starts simple, right? You see a lot of artists that as they get mature, they, um, they simplify. Picasso, when he was a student, when he was your age, he could draw better than anyone in the world. He was super real. Um, so that was no longer a challenge. So he said, I'm going to invent a way of seeing the universe, and everything's flat, and I'm going to compress space. And he did. So, you know, he's tried to simplify it. That's actually the, the hard part, is how do you take this sophisticated information and trick people into thinking that it's complicated when it's actually really simple. <laughs> Ooh, that's nice. I'm super pumped about that. See that nose shape? That's kind of a fun shape. And again, that's my interpretation of that nose. Other people are going to do it way, way different. So this is a weird area. Because of my collage of that, it's really making weird shapes. So see what happens. Solve that problem so beautifully. Let's see if I can capture it. And also, when you're working this simple, right, my shapes are pretty flat. So, because they're flat, I can really design the shapes because I don't have a lot of content. I can see how those shapes are going to work amongst each other and make some fun solutions. Then once I'm happy with those shapes, then I'll get in there and you know, start the rendering. Yeah, we're getting close. But there's one book, it's called How to Draw the Marvel Way, if you've seen that. You see it everywhere, and it's almost easy to disregard. That's a really fantastic book. Definitely check that one out. Um, all the Andrew Loomis books, those are at art stores all the time. He's called, one's called Creative Anatomy. Another one's called um, uh, Creative Illustration. Creative Illustration. They have that upstairs. Oh, do they? Good. Yes, yes. I was trying to remember. Is it creative at the beginning, too? <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good one. So those are timeless. Like I even had a colleagues like I don't even know why they make new art books those are just so good um, so they are they're genuinely really good so definitely check those out how I make a picture by Rockwell sort of was my guiding light for many years and even if you don't like Rockwell the intensity at which he approaches this whole art business is uh, is inspiring and I, I recommend it to anybody is that the title of the book, Francis? How I Make a Picture. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. How great is that, right? You wish every <laughs> artist made a book. How I do this. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to speed this up. Let's see. I like the feel of this, though, the way that the tool is skipping over the sort of the history that I was talking about. I'm pretty pleased with that. It doesn't always work that way. And a lot, of, a lot of people are concerned with style, and I get it. Usually that's one of the primary concerns of a young art student, I need to find my style. First thing, first problem is trying to find your style. It's going to find you, and it's going to be a result of intensive research into what type of art you like. It is sort of an organic thing, and it will come. But another colleague and friend of mine, Jane Radstrom, put it really eloquently. She said that the style is a result of an influence from art history, so say Rembrandt, then a 
contemporary art influence. So, like I mentioned, James Jean, perhaps. Um, as well as something you care about that's not art related. Mm -hmm. So that could be unicorns or <laughs> basketball or anything. So you combine those three things that are true to you after years of thinking about it and exploring. With that as a guiding light, you can almost ask yourself, what are those things now? And then keep asking yourself, what are those things as you move into the future? And um, you'll, be, you'll, you'll find a pretty exciting result. And there's a big difference between artists that you respect and artists that inspire you. I, I, I respect two million artists for sure. Like I said, I'm a big nut for that. As far as artists that I look to for inspiration, there's maybe 20. And generally, off the top of my head, probably five that I look towards all the time. Um, Rockwell, Mike Mignola, Paul Pope, George Pratt, Gary Kelly. Most, mostly. Okay, we're getting somewhere, folks. I'm about to start turning these edges here in a second. I feel good with this texture that I'm getting. So, this is another big deal. Look at how ugly those shapes are. Those are nonsense. They're offending me. Um, so, again, you look at the world, the world doesn't always give you exactly what you need. So, what is your interpretation of these wrinkles in this ascot? How can you make that more beautiful or just more interesting? Um, that was a big lesson I learned from a teacher because I would have a, a, um, a clothes model and they would have a bunch of drapery like that. That's terrible, that's nonsense, I don't like that. So he would go up, can I move your drapery? And he would move it and make it more simple and interesting, pleasant. You're not always gonna get that, but if you know what those shapes look like, then that could really influence your, your piece. This, this area is problem, problematic to me, so I'm gonna keep working on it, folks. This is what I call faking rendering, right? Because it, it looks good and the form feels nice, but you're not sitting there and laboring on it all the time. And that is made more possible because of the how you started out with, with drawing and then uh, tearing the the paper and then pasting it on? Not so much. This is a result of um, using a medium that is dense enough and sits on the surface that when you hit it, it can be still manipulated. Um, so I usually use charcoal, like you've seen here. Um, so I'll show you. It's, it's really beautiful. It gives you really velvety marks. And the idea came from the Russians, they have a thing called Russian sauce, and the whole entire, it's a cool name, but the whole entire idea is um, you get charcoal to have this velvet feel, so you take this and then watch how beautiful that transitions. Okay. It's fantastic. So again, this is the first time I've ever done a fancy, so I'm not sure how I feel about it yet, but. Also, exterior edges are important. So I'm gonna soften this entire edge of this base.
things are starting to happen. But with the face, certain things and forms are turning. That edge is still too sharp. I wish it could be a little softer. So what's going to happen is a really big deal though, because I'm at least trying to give the illusion of this face existing. But see how all my values are really grouped together here? It's not a lot of contrast. So I've been planning this entire time to drop in some dark shapes in here and some accent points that are going to really identify the face. So imagine the teeth, I'm going to drop in white. It's going to identify the teeth. For the nose, you put a highlight here, a dime for that. Then the actual shape of the glasses and then potentially a gradient of dark from under the brim of the hat, fill in that shape, so on and so forth. So if the face isn't super clear now, and I think it reasonably is, it will absolutely feel clear once you drop in those moments. If this was me at the studio, then I'd spend about three more hours and refine all this rendering here. But. So the bottom edge of the teeth be a sharp edge and as it transitions into the lips it should be a little softer because that's where the shadow is at. I want to make the grooves of the teeth. Just make it with the brush. Okay. So now this is where the cool cool part happens. So we remember this little guy, I forgot about this guy. But that's showing us where the highlights are at. So I'm going to start bringing those in here and then the volume should really start popping pretty, pretty nicely. Are you able to take pretty good advantage of having a rock hole here? Or is it one of the things like you're so close that you're not able to make it too much? Or like I have a really awesome theater by my house that I never go to because it's by my house. helpful. So you see how that popped out the silhouette of his head? That was nice. And then I can keep further doing it. <coughs> What I need you to do, you see this white shape right here? So I'm going to put red on it 
Can you make a bunch of those marks all over this white shape there? Cool. Awesome. That's how you've painted before. <laughs> We're going nuts over here, guys. <laughs> Round of applause. Nice. Yeah. I like it. Is it okay if I put a couple more marks there? Okay. But, see the deal is, those marks were probably better than someone that would have labored on that, right? That done, that's done. It's just an abstract collection of marks. You're not looking at that as the focal point. It's just to make the area interesting and allow the viewer to move on in the piece because this isn't a piece about that, that collar, right? It's a piece about the face. So we can do all sorts of other things we're going past that. I always tell my students, you got to make the mark like you mean it. And I think a lot of art and a lot of solutions for the, like, the world's problems, sort of, right, is you're given a, a tricky situation and you have to figure your way out of it, solve your way out of it. So that can be as big as world hunger, right? But it can be as small as, you know, your piece, you're, you're losing your mojo and your piece. It's not very exciting. So you put a big red mark over the eyes, the best part. So then you got to solve those eyes again and you're going to you know, have some <coughs> exciting moments. And every demo, I got to do this because it's fun. Get a little splatter. Right? So let me say this first: the simpler the shape I do when I arc around the face, the more interesting. Because if I put a stroke on the outside of the head, that's going to leave this negative space here. Because this negative, this this. Um, contour already exists, that shape exists, how can I add to that? So what I mean is that's creating a shape within a shape. So now you got that negative space left in between. And I'm going to show you what happens when you do that stylistically. Then what if I drop another tone in there? That could be pretty fun. So, for my final performance, um, I'm going to fill in that negative area. I'm doing just a lot of goofing, right? There's not a concept behind it, and that's dangerous because illustration should have a concept and a story and a meaning behind what you're doing. Um, but to see me here ideate and do thumbnails isn't going to be a dynamic demo necessarily. Um, Rocco would always start with a guy leaning up against a, a post, a light post, and he would come up with ideas from there. So keep that in mind, right? Like this isn't necessarily what illustration is. It's, it's, you're, you're creating fun pictures, and that's part of it. But the real meat and potatoes comes with solving visual problems, um, documenting the world. I mean, you have some crazy things going on in the world, documenting that. I went to a protest. Um, and I won't talk about my political leanings, more so just to see what was happening, and I sketched it. It's in another sketchbook. If I can offer anything to this, what's going on now, it is that, right, as an artist to record things. Um, so that's the meat and potatoes. That's the real reason that we, we create art. Um, but again, like, uh, that's, that's another time and place. I just wanted to show you some pretty exciting um, mixed media stuff. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.